Father, we come before you right now and ask for forgiveness of our sins and thank you for this time of worship. Praying, Father God, that we will hear from you once again. We thank you for the studies that we had thus far, the things that you have shared with us, Father God, your divine truth. Now, Lord, I pray that I will remove myself that we might hear from your Holy Spirit. Speak to your manservant. Lord, let me yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. For Father, we know that your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our hearts. We we give you all the glory and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Blessed Sunday morning. And once again, this is Pastor Moultrie, the assistant pastor of Cokesbury uh, First Baptist Church in Port Deposit, Maryland. And today we're going to continue as promised in our studies in the book of Ephesians. It's a very extraordinary book. Uh, that explains about the dynamic of the church, the dynamic of church unity, the dynamic of the spiritual gifts. It talks about the uh, identification of the believer, our ID, our possessions, our privilege, and, and, and our positions in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, as we said last week, we want to look at uh, chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, I want to probably emphasize today verses... 11 and 12. Today we want to talk about the unity within the body and, and what does that mean if God is the God of reconciliation. See in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul said all things are of God and he has reconciled us to himself and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation and we're going to look to see uh, God's ministry of reconciliation and how he works through us because we are his workmanship and how he uses us for that ministry of reconciliation, how it applies even to the things that we face today, our world face today. So without any further prolonging, let's get into the word of God. We're going to start at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. This is the King James Version. The word of the Lord uh, speaks as such. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. Therefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uh, uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh by, uh, 
in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And, and, and let the church say amen. This is the word of the Lord that we're reading for today. And, and where we left off last week, we talked about the mercies of God. And that, that was just so awesome just to be able to preach that and share that because it ministered to me because it reminds me so much what God has took me from and what he brought me to because of his redeeming grace. And what we said about God's mercy, that God's mercy is rich. And we looked at Psalms 51 when David was repenting of his sin and he proclaimed before God that God's mercy is, is multitudes that it blot out his transgressions, even the great sin that he did, that God was able to reconcile him. David, once he repented, knew where to turn to. And, and then we looked at Jonah chapter 4, verses 2, when Jonah proclaimed mercies of God. I didn't want to preach because I knew uh, as, as detestable as the Ninevites were, that your mercy could cover this sin, and I knew it. And he had a lot of hostility. Matter of fact, Jonah was just a byproduct of Israel, their sentiments towards their enemies back then in the Old Testament anyway. And Jonah said, Lord, I knew that you was gracious. I knew you, I knew that you was merciful. I knew that you were slow to anger. I knew that you had kindness. That's why I didn't want to preach. He understood the mercies of God. Amen. And matter of fact, uh, Jeremiah said, we didn't get over there last week, but Jeremiah said that God's mercy is so awesome that that is by his mercy that we're not consumed in the book of uh, uh, Lamentations. That's what the prophets say. Matter of fact, there are things, even after salvation, we're saved today. And those of us who have Christ and there are things that we think, not even just the deeds, forget about the deeds or what we do. Let's talk about the things that we think that nobody else knows about except for God. What we think is enough to incriminate us for us to be consumed by the wrath of God. And, 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 and Jeremiah said, it is by his mercy that we're not consumed. And then when God takes it, not only God's mercy is so awesome, and he's rich and abundance in that mercy, but when God's mercy is so powerful that when I go through the day, activity of everyday life, and God's mercy take me through that day, and God's mercy guides me through the night when I'm not even conscious, and I'm fast asleep, and by his mercy, he has the breath of life in me that I can wake up that next morning. Guess what? God don't recycle his mercy. Jeremiah said that God has a new set of mercy that's waiting for me to face the next 24 hours. Isn't that awesome? That God's mercy is abundant. So, so last week we learned about God's mercy and we under, uh, understood exactly who we were before we came to Christ. That we were dead in trespasses and sins. And we learned about his uh, tremendous grace. But this week, we understand about his grace. See, before I can even uh, comprehend the magnitude of God's grace, God helps me to understand his mercy. Because his mercy is his divine love that he has for sinners. To hold back what we deserve. See, see Hebrews says, it's a point unto men once to die. And after that, there's a judgment. And also, the word also tells us it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, the only thing that we had, we're going to look at the Gentiles today, the only thing that we had going for us in terms of hope was lack of hope before Jesus Christ. And what mercy does, mercy held back what we should have got. And today we learn about grace because grace gives us what we didn't deserve is God's unmerited favor. Now, actually, excuse me, let's start with uh, verse 8. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, see what God, God is sharing with Jews and Gentiles alike, not only in Ephesus, but in general, that, that, that when he redeemed us and he changed us, that we went from lostness to redemption. We went from blind, from darkness, to the light. The Bible says, Peter said, we are the so forth praises unto him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light because we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a holy nation. Amen? 
because of his grace. And, if, and because of that grace, we can't boast because we didn't deserve it. And, and it, now let me share something else about that, that, that verse 8. He says, uh, for by grace, we memorize this all the time. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not the worst, as any man should boast. Now, grace, we know, is unmerited favor. And here's what I want to share. But also, what Paul says, if you really want to look at this, we already uh, established the fact in week one that salvation is of the Lord. He says that through faith. He says, uh, and not that of yourself. It is. What is the if? Well, the it is the grace, but the it is also faith. Wait a minute, Pastor, but what are you saying about faith? What I'm saying that that the faith that we have to receive Christ and to live for Christ, that faith was even given to us. Based on what? Based on John chapter 6, verse 44. We said that last week. Uh, uh, no man cometh to the Son lest the Father draws him. John 6, 37. All that the Father give to me shall come to me. He that cometh to me, I shall no wise cast out. Look, the point to what I'm saying is that, remember we said last week that we were the walking dead and the dead man can't respond to truth till the Spirit of God wakes up his consciousness so that he can receive. And it's a combination by what? The Word of God in the Spirit of God. Because Titus 3, 5, he says, Not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy have he what? Saved us by what? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of his spirit. You see, it took the word of God and the spirit of God to speak to a dead soul to wake us up in the consciousness. So God, not only that, but God gave us, God gave me and God gave you the faith to even believe that he could save us. Watch this, Hebrews chapter 12. Why? First and foremost, because Jesus is the author of, and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2. He says, looking unto Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, God loves you so much that not only did he chose us, not only did he predestinate us, he gave us the awareness by his spirit that we were lost with lostness, and then gave us the faith that we can profess him and receive him as our savior. Amen. That's called saving faith. Amen. And then we have Romans chapter 12, three, uh, Paul says, for I say that through the grace that's given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to soberly according to God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. You see, even the faith that we have, comes from God. And then Paul says in Galatians, he said, the life that I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Even after salvation, what does it take for me to grow progressively? Remember we talked about that word uh, uh, progressive sanctification because God wants me to mature and to grow into the image of Christ? Well, it took, it takes faith. It still takes faith. And that faith as I, uh, as I, uh, read God's word and, and yield to the obedience of his Holy Spirit and, and God's faith, God gives me to faith to stay on this journey and to continue to grow. And God adds things to that faith based on Second Peter chapter 1 to the faith that we already have that God gives and give us everything what we need for the journey to worship and to serve him. And, and, that's, and that's important. But now, Saints, rightfully so, we always quote Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We, we, yeah, we do. We, we always quote it. And we, and we should. By right, we should. But there's a verse after that, you see. He says that not by works, lest any man should boast. He said, but we, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Amen which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. See, the reason why we know that is God's faith that he gives to me to believe in him because the faith that God gives to the sinner produces results. See, see, there's no formal work that we can do 
Matter of fact, Isaiah gives me four reasons. I will share this. Why I can't get saved on my own. He says, he said, we are all unclean things. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. We fade as the leaf and our iniquity like the wind has taken us away. So it's, so it becomes unanimously by God and by myself to understand that I can't rescue myself. But when God gives me faith, not only does he save me, but he does a work in me. And when he does a work in me, it, 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 it prompts me to do good works for him and towards others. Amen. That's what he's saying. So in verse 10, he said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained in them. Also, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it's God who worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. See, I don't I, I don't do works to be saved. We do works because we're saved. That's why James says that faith without works is dead. The person who's truly genuinely saved, God is going to do it. Now, now we grow a different path. I understand it. We're not perfect, but God takes the sinner. And based on Romans chapter 6, we have a new nature. He said, because as many are planted in the likeness of his death, we have also been planted or made in the likeness of his resurrection. Why? Because we are made in the newness of life. And as God does his work through the sinner, even regardless of the baggage that we have, hear, hear me now, is that eventually, because God works through me, God works in me. He's going to do his work through me. How do we know that? Because that work is going to be manifested by the fruits of righteousness that we produce. Jesus says in John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth must fruit. He says, for without me, you can't do nothing. Jesus says, because we are tied into him. And we are the branches and we're tied into the true vine. A person who is a true branch connected to the true vine eventually will produce good works. So that's why I want to make sure that we understand it. Because Paul says that to understand our identity, we're saved by grace. And when a person is saved by grace, God does a mighty work. And that work is manifested what he does in us, he does also through us, and is and is manifested by what we do for God and what we do for others. Amen. 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 I just want to share that. That's a very important aspect. So now, up to this point, Paul is addressing uh to the church of Ephesus as well as the other churches in Asia Minor, but he's also addressing to Jews and Gentiles alike. Now here's here's where we get to our point. Because we talked about reconciliation. In verse 11, he speaks about the issue of being reconciled to Christ. I want to share the verse I just shared at the very beginning, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All things are of God, and he has reconciled us to himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our nation, like I said last week, and it's not only nationwide, but it's globally. Because of the, uh, we, we remember the invitation I gave last Sunday? Uh, I spoke about the sin pandemic. For by one man sent it into the world, and death by sin, and death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And it's because of the sin nature of this world, and we talked last week, about the prince and the power of the air, who was Satan, right? We, we talked about that. And we said that he has influence over the world, influence over society. He influences viewpoints. He influences opinions. He influences ethics, sociology, economics, uh, 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 psychology, uh, political endeavors. He influenced those things. Why? Uh, false religions. And he also influenced how the human race relate to one another. And we are seeing the dividends because of a fallen world. And what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about division. I'm talking about fences or walls and barriers. And, and can I just share something real quick? 
uh, the racial colors or ethnicities or because of the color of our skin is not the only barrier that we face. And, and guess what? This is nothing new that's under the sun. Uh, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun because Paul had to address barriers even in the first century church. See, he had to address uh, barriers because of, there was barriers in terms of cliques. When he wrote to the Corinthians, there was division within the body. Uh, instead of following Christ, they began to follow people. And I'm not saying it was wrong to follow people who were spiritual authority, but they began to have hero worship. That means that they stopped coming out to Bible study if a certain person was preaching the teaching. So what they did was that there was a certain following. He said, I'm glad I ain't baptized any of y'all. There were cliques. He had to deal with separation because of the misunderstanding uh, 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 of the gender or men and women's roles in public worship. Why? Because there was a barrier. There was division. He had to deal with saints trying to take each other to court in, in chapter 6 because there was division. And then in the book of Galatians, he had to deal with division and barrier because there were Judaizers who was trying to tell the Gentiles, and the word Gentile comes from the word of uh, someone who was not of a Jewish descent. Actually, in the Greek, the word Gentile means, uh, it's a Greek word, the ethanos, which we get the word ethnicity. It means nations. So it's someone who's not of Jewish descent in the book of Galatians, what Paul did, Paul had to address those who was trying to tell the Gentile converts, that they, they could not be converts unless they became Jews first. So he always had to deal, and then the book of Colossians, he had to deal with strange teachings. But what about the book of Ephesians? He didn't have to deal with anything with separation with them. Surely not. Not in the book of Ephesians. Not those who are faithful that he calls at the very beginning. Actually, he did. You see, Paul had to deal with with the vision in the church, in the church of Ephesus, in the churches of Asia Minor, because the, the church itself had populations of Jews and Gentiles. Now, normally, like for instance, when you read the book of Acts, or when we read the book of uh, 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 the epistles, where Paul and Galatians we just talked about, is that the Jews were the minorities, and Paul had to somehow minister, just like the council of Acts chapter 15 had to show that God was doing a mighty work where the Gentiles were also recipients of God's redeeming grace as well as the Jews. And then he speaks about this mystery in chapter 3. I'm not, I'm not trying not to get ahead of myself. The mystery was that God took Jews and Gentiles and made them together as one, this living organism that we call the called out ones, the ecclesia, the church. Amen? But Ephesus was a little bit different. You know why? Because in, in, in the church of Ephesus, the majority of the memberships were Gentiles. And the minority were Jews. Even though the Jews, they were converted first. But the Gentiles were converted afterwards. But there was more Gentiles than Jews. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was, was that there was a division because of the hostility that existed between the Jews and Gentiles outside in the secular world. And what we saw in the Old Testament, even during the time of Jesus, that while he was here on earth, existed also in the church. Well, you say, well, that, that shouldn't be. Well, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that what Satan does, whatever sins and things that happen, we talked about this briefly last week, not so much about reconciliation, but about sin, that whenever there's a narrative that he, uh, a narrative that he engaged and initiates in the world, and the narrative we're talking about today is division, barriers, separation, tensions, inequalities, things of those things that take place, it becomes extremely important because also that same mindset, even though we don't think it does, but it does, trust me, it comes right into the local assembly. Now, if it happened more than 2,000 years ago when Paul was here on this earth and he's ministering in Asia Minor in Europe, don't you think it's happening today? So what he's saying is that we have to understand the significance of of Jesus Christ not only saving us, but what promotes true unity? 
that's the stance of the church that we should take. So as we look at, and, 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 and his book of Ephesians, there's some things that he says. Because there was hostility between the Jews. and See, see the Jews, they were hostile because they had the law of Moses. And they wasn't used to a, a, a group coming in who, who, who was not familiar with the ceremonial or moral laws of Moses. So there was, a, there was some baggage that the Gentiles came into the local assembly with. How they worshipped. There were some pagan things. They were used to, especially in Ephesus, the goddess of Diana and Artemis. And some of the practice of worship, they brought right into the local assembly. So the Jews were offended. And then the Gentiles were offended because they weren't familiar with the things of Moses. And they weren't, and they weren't of Jewish descent. And it was always the stigma that hung over them that the Jews really looked down on us. They didn't really like us. So that became an issue. So Paul has to address it so it would be unity within the church. Look what he says. So in verse 11, he says, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. You see, see what Paul is saying? Paul says, now he has to, and this he's talking to both groups, but he's really talking to the majority. He's talking to the Gentiles. He says, I want you to understand, I already told you that all of us were dead and trespassing to sin, but I want to specifically show how you, a non-Jew, came to Christ. He said, first of all, you were alienated socially. Then he tells them they were alienated also spiritually. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, in verse in, in the verse 11, they were alienated socially simply because of the doings of man. Alienated means that the Jews did can, can, can I put any plain into this? The Jews just didn't like them. Amen? Because, and part of it was the Jews' fault, a lot of it was, because God separated the Jews as a nation. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham, right, made a covenant. And the purpose of God separating the Jews was so that they would uh, be a light to other nations. He called them out. They were supposed to be how they conducted themselves, not only through the moral ethics, through the Mosaic law, not only through, but also through the ceremonial customs. But they were to look different. They were to be different. They were to be distinguished from all the rest of the nations around the world. But the problem was God also called them out so they might be a blessing to others. The problem was when they were called out, the Jews thought they were supposed to be superior to others. That was not God's design. See, somehow they had mistaken divine election for selfish elitism. So there was hostility. Matter of fact, in, in, in Jesus' time when he was here on earth, if a Jew uh, went into a Gentile land, when he entered into Palestine, he would have to shake the dust, or he felt that he had to shake the dust off his sandals and his clothes because he did not want to defile the Holy Land with the land by uncircumcised uh, uh, dirt that he just came through. That's how much they detest. If, 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 if a young man was Jewish and he married a Gentile woman or during the time when Jesus was here on earth, the family did not have a wedding. What they did, they had a funeral service because in their minds, he was dead to them. If he had a wife who was a Gentile who wasn't Jewish, I'm telling you, the disrespect was real, like the young people said. And so this stuff kind of filtered in the church. So the apostle Paul says, first of all, I want you to understand, Gentiles, that when you got here, you was alienated because the Jews couldn't stand you. He's a matter of fact, they came up with the name uncircumcisions because of the fact that they looked down to you, that you was called out to be different. He said, by which call the circumcision, he said, and, and actually, with, now watch this now. King James said, by which is called the circumcision and the flesh made by hand. Now, in the other translation, it says, Paul is saying, by which so-called the circumcision, because Paul had this disdain. Well, see, when Paul got saved, Paul says it kind of like a tongue-in-cheek. He, yeah, he said, yeah, by those who were supposed to be circumcised. Now, why is that? Because Paul was sharing in reality, and actually, that those who were uh, circumcised, the true circumcisions, or those who were circumcised of the heart. 
not just a physical mark on their body. So Paul understood that this was not part of God's plan, the superiority complex that they had. So he explained it to them that they were alienated. Amen? Matter of fact, when you talk about the alienation of the Gentiles and the Jews, you see what happened. But see, Paul says the Jews, they thought they were superior, but the true circumcised was a matter of the heart. Colossians 2.11, he says, In whom you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcisions of Christ. In Galatians chapter 5, 6, he says, For in Jesus Christ there is neither circumcisions avail of anything, nor uncircumcisions, but faith which worketh by love. See, the true circumcised is a matter what takes place in the heart. They were sharing in Sunday school in the morning about Ezekiel, when God was talking to Israel in Ezekiel chapter 36. And he said, I will sprinkle you with clean water. You shall be cleansed from all your idolatry and filthiness shall I cleanse you. He says that he's going to take the heart, that stone, that, that's not receptible to receive spiritual truth will be obedient. And he's going to replace it with a heart of flesh. That, that, that's why you see the manifestation of that within the true church in Philippians chapter 2, 13. Because it's God who worketh in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. He says you were outcast. So what I just described right now in chapter, in, in, in chapter 11. Uh, um, in times past when he speaks about it he said and when I describe in chapter 11 he says that we call that an alienation of, 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 of socially it was man's doing not what God some us did but it was response of sinful man you know why you know why it's so important because what brings walls and separation is when and not just the color of skin is when we think that we are more superior than another people it can be social class. It can be gender related. You see, one of the things that Paul also had to address was that slaves, because they did have slave and slave owners back then in the first century. But the slave owners and the slaves came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And there was even hostility in that because even after the cross, the slaves thought that at least the mentality and the attitude of the slave owners should have been godly and righteous. And when that didn't happen, and they still saw the slaves as second-class citizen, oh, I wish I had somebody. When they saw the slaves as second-class citizen, it brought resentment to that born-again slave to try to try to find out and figure out why the slave owner, who now who is saved, still looked down him, still suppressed him, and still looked down on him. See, and what and what exists today is that we see se separation in the world. Now, now let me take it a step further. Some of that mentality takes place in the church. That's why James had to deal with that. When he addresses favoritism. And see what the Bible preaches and what Paul is telling us. That in the true church, all are one. It's a oneness within the body of Christ. Men, women, ethnicity, social class, regardless, bond or free, we're one in Christ. What do you mean by oneness? Oneness in terms of value, dignity, and worth. I was just sharing with, with a group of men on Thursday night, and we were talking about the equality of uh, 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 the equality between men and women. The value, their separation uh, between uh, responsibilities in the church and within the marriage, but in terms of worth, in terms of value, in terms of acceptance, in terms of dignity, there's equality. And somehow, uh, uh, even as saints, we lose focus on that. Now, what about what happens in the outside world? Well, what I believe, and he, he, here's my point. What I believe is that where we stand as a church, and where we, we, we not that we should, we have to, is that true unity starts with the blood of Jesus Christ. When I get to the end of the message, you'll see exactly where I'm coming from, because I didn't say that. The word says that, okay? Let's keep reading. So we talked about the social alienation. Now, we go to verse 13. He says, but now, and he says, uh, excuse me, verse 12. He says, at that time, ye were without Christ. Now, uh, I, want, I want to take my time and really explain this the right way. Now, because I want you to see there's a difference between verse 11 and verse 12. 
they're both alienated. He's talking about the Gentiles. Because he has to talk to the Gentiles because how they feel about the Jews. They're alienated socially by the Jews, but also they were alienated by God himself. Why? Because in verse 12, he said, at that time, you were without Christ. That's the first thing he's telling them, that they were alienated because they did not have the Messiah. Uh, in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke of the coming of the Messiah. The Jews should have known, and those who were saved did know. That the Messiah, that the one who came, where was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, that was the Messiah. They had the, the coming and the awareness that Jesus was the Messiah. They said in the Old Testament, and also uh, you know, before the plan of redemption, that the Gentiles, as anyone who's not a Jewish descent, they did not have the true God. Matter of fact, as I stated before, they worship in this church uh, before salvation, the Gentiles Many of them were Greek, and the Greek also thought that they were uppity because they looked at everyone else who wasn't Greek as barbarians. But they worshipped the goddess Diana and Artemis. They worshipped false gods. They weren't, uh, there was no theocracy among the Gentile nations. It was polytheistic. They worshipped several gods. Amen? So he said that you were without, he explained it to them, without God, without the Messiah, without Jesus Christ. Also, he says in verse 12, you're alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, meaning that they were not of the citizenship. God called, talked to Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, said that he will give him land, he will give him a name, give him a seed, give him a nation. They weren't part of that. He said that they were not of the Jewish commonwealth. The things that God blessed to the nation called Israel, they had no parts of that. So, so not only did they not have, matter of fact, Psalms 147, 20, the psalmist says he has not dealt with, so any nations, as for his judgment, they have not known them, praise ye the Lord. He's speaking about the uniqueness of Israel. Remember, so number one, he told the Gentiles from God's perspective, he says, you were number one, without God. Number two, you were out there and you were apart from the Jewish commonwealth. You were not of the Jewish citizenship. And he says, now number three, he says this, he says, um, make sure I don't get ahead of myself. And you are strangers from the covenant of promise. The other thing he said, all the uh, covenant, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic Covenant became a derivative out of that. You had the Palestinian Covenant, the Nevada Covenant that was given. They were not inheritors of that covenant, of those promises. Why? Because they was alienated from the things God. He's telling from God's perspective, spiritually. See, verse 11, he talks about what happened socially, how the people felt about them. Then he's telling them positionally, outside of Christ, who they were. Without Christ... Without citizenship, without the covenants, and without hope. That's what he says in verse, keep reading, verse uh, 12. Having no hope and without God in the world. Why? Because the only thing that they had at that time in relationship to God was that when they die, they want to face judgment. It was a bitter end. No hope. He said that's who they were. See, he's trying to remind them that I know, I know, I know there's a history between you and the Jews. He's telling the Gentiles in the church. He said, you're going to have to work it out because the, and the, the reality of what the blood of Jesus Christ did. Now watch this now. He says, but now, verse 13, in Christ, we see in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, ye sometimes were far off. That word far off was actually a terminology that the Jews used about the Gentiles that said they were far off from the things that they had. That, they, they made up that terminology. He says, made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who had made both one. What did he do? He made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petitions. Now we come to the practical pit stop. What have we learned? We learned that the Jews, because they missed their calling 
and how they missed the mark because what God has called them out for, they took the wrong sense of superiority. There was hostility. We learned about the Gentiles and their hostility to the Jews and God reminded them what they were specifically as a nation and how he called them out of darkness and brought them. But the most important thing, he brought them together as one. What should the church do outside in the world with all the tensions going on? Well, it starts, watch this now. It starts with the gospel. Why? Because first chapter one, Paul says, in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus Christ breaks down the petitional wall. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to do that. This is a story I'm reminded of. Um, in Second World War, there was an American fighter pilot who was fighting in the Pacific and he was taken down very quickly. He was taken captive. Uh, by the Japanese Empire. He's a prisoner of war. They tortured him daily. He suffered. He said the only thing that kept him alive was his hatred towards the Japanese. And he vowed that if he ever gets out of that camp alive, he would never set ground on Japanese soil again. And so what happens is that by God spared his life. He wasn't saved. He was a sinner without Christ. Spared his life. He's allowed to return back home to the United States. He comes to the saving knowledge through uh, divine circumstances. And not only did he come to the saving knowledge, a few years later, God calls him to the ministry, and then God calls him to the mission field. He wants to go to Africa. God sends him right to the place that he vowed he would never set place on. God sends him right back to Japan. And he preaches the gospel. People come to the saving knowledge. The people that he wants hate it and then one day he's on the subway and he's sitting there and he sits beside a gentleman he starts talking to this gentleman and he leads this gentleman to christ this gentleman just so happened to be the commanding pilot who led the raid on pearl harbor and him and this gentleman they teamed up in ministries and they led thousands upon thousands in japan to christ the blood of jesus christ breaks down the middle wall petition what do we do as a church see the world ain't going to change yet we we should make sure that no one should be abused no one should be fall victim to 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 injustice but what we know was the world don't know it has to start with the heart the world what we do as a church we had to have a campaign, not only through Zoom and stuff, because we, we do do that now because of the pandemic. But now, take our liberty and embrace the world with the gospel. Because if a man's heart don't change, the wall ain't falling. It starts with the gospel. It ends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the church's positions. Now, what do we do about it? We just don't talk about it. We got to go do that means that we got to be around those who don't know Christ and we got to present Christ as a solution. You see, and I'm not knocking the churches, but we, we got to understand that, that as church and church leaders, that the kingdom agenda don't change. The only thing that's going to change the heart of man is the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul shows that because there was racial tension plus more back then in the first century church. And as the question I asked before, if he had to deal with those things back then, don't you think we got to deal with those stuff today? 2,000 years later? That was the people who first heard the gospel divinely inspired in the first century. That's where we stand. And that's where we sit. And this, this message should be encouraging to all of us because God himself is the one who can break down that wall. Now, we're going to stop there because I think I overdid my time. But with that being said, we, we always want to hear uh, extended gospel to those who don't know Christ. And the Bible tells us once again, chapter 8, we read it, for by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is God's extended love to give the, uh, the, the gift of salvation to dying sinners. And you cannot earn it, but it's a gift. And, and, the, and, and you come by the way of the avenue of faith. And if you believe 
the record of what God has done for you through his son. That he died, he was buried, and rose again the third day. And you want to receive that truth personally. Because you got to make a personal commitment to it. Then ask him to come to your heart and save you. You can share, Father, I know I'm a sinner. And I heard the plan of salvation. I know that Jesus died for my sins. And I receive him right now into my heart by faith. Lord Jesus, I ask forgiveness of my sins. Come into my life and save me. I thank you for hearing my prayer. I'm asking you right now, Lord, taking a step of faith. Change my life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Saints of God, we're going to continue in chapter 2. We're going to continue with this whole ordeal of reconciliation. True reconciliation come from Christ. Be blessed. May God bless you.